In the fall of every year, a sad ritual once took place on American Indian reservations across our country. It was when the wagons came, and in later years, the buses. They came to take the children away, away to boarding schools where they were to be taught the white man's way. An attempt to civilize, Christianize, and Europeanize the Indian. The boarding school movement created its own legacy. For the Indian people, it is a legacy of homesickness and isolation, coping and survival, and the breakup of the family. The boarding school experience has had a long-term profound impact on Native Americans spanning generations. For these former students, remembering these schools conjures up bittersweet memories. Almost as soon as the Europeans arrived on the east coast of the American continent, schooling for its native inhabitants was instituted with the idea of changing them and removing them from their own culture. Several of America's earliest colleges received some of their original funding on the grounds that they would house and educate youths from the surrounding tribes. Before the Europeans landed, the Indians surely had an intact sophisticated culture, one that valued tradition, art, commerce, and education. The education of the children was vital for the survival of each tribe. It was the means to transfer their culture, stabilize the economic system, and maintain the ecosystem. The manner of educating native children was a task borne by the extended family and all members of their society. But to the Europeans, the Indian culture was viewed as inferior and they felt this gave them the right to dispossess the natives of their land and most anything else they held dear. The federal government's involvement in Indian education has its roots in the United States Constitution. Article 7 of the Constitution says that treaties are the supreme law of the land and most treaties between Indian tribes and the federal government included provisions for education. Tribal leaders were eager to negotiate for a classroom education. Indians understood that they would be living in the presence of the white man's culture and knew it was wise for their children to be exposed to it. Little did they suspect that education as envisioned by the federal government would seek to erase their Indian languages and traditional values. Indians gave up vast homelands for smaller parcels of land in order to secure benefits for their people, including education. In the period between 1775 and 1834, 119 treaties guaranteed education for the signing tribe in perpetuity. In total, through treaties and agreements, Indian tribes ceded to the United States almost a billion acres of land. For the young nation, President Thomas Jefferson articulated an idealist philosophy towards Indian education. American culture represented the highest achievement of civilization, he said. In the new nation had the obligation to share its values and way of life with other peoples. Beginning in 1802, during the Jefferson presidency, Congress offered funds to religious groups to, quote, provide civilizations among the Aborigines, unquote. This fund was enlarged in 1819 when Congress passed the Indian Civilization Fund Act, an annual appropriation. Tapping into federal dollars, churches established numerous schools, fulfilling the federal obligation to educate Indian peoples. Two million dollars went to the churches for this purpose in one 10-year period alone, from 1845 to 1855.
By the 1830s, in the age of Andrew Jackson, a military hero and notorious Indian fighter, Americans embraced the notion of manifest destiny, the belief that U.S. expansion over the whole of North America had divine sanction. It meant pushing the Indian peoples aside in the name of progress, and progress moved westward. Jackson endorsed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which exiled several Indian tribes to western lands at a cost of thousands of lives. The 1850s and 1860s were marked by warfare and treaty negotiations aimed at removing even more Indians from their homelands. During this era of bloodshed, General Philip Sheridan proclaimed, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. The notion of manifest destiny gradually gave way to what became known as the assimilationist era. A return to the Jeffersonian notion that Indians could be molded to disappear into the fabric of America. Prompting this shift from bloodshed to absorption was the realization that warfare was not eliminating the Indian. In fact, a study of the Indian population in 1877 revealed that far from vanishing, Indians were increasing in numbers. In addition, the nation had just fought a great civil war, a war which made men free from slaves. So how could the Indian be treated with such obvious injustice? During the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, who served two terms beginning in 1868, a new strategy in dealing with Indians was pursued, dubbed the Grant Peace Policy. It was partially put into place by a Seneca Indian. Eli S. Parker, a friend of Grant's, appointed as a Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Within this setting, a reform movement emerged, fueled largely by white Anglo-Saxon Christian reformers from the cities of the Northeast. This group, who became known as the Friends of the Indians, convened in regional national organizations such as the Indian Rights Association. They set out to save the Indian, as they put it, and to introduce Indian youth to, quote, civilized ideas, wants, and aspirations. These reformers were confident that they had the answer to what was termed the Indian problem. The greater part of that answer was education, but not just any type of education. For them, school had to become a total environment, and day school was not enough. The school had to remove the student from parental influence and what was called the downpull of the camp. In other words, the school had to strip the Indian of their own culture and, as one historian put it, collapse the evolution of centuries into a few years. And the answer was boarding school. In 1879, the federal effort to directly establish and run its own Indian school system began with the establishment of the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Dissatisfied with the lack of transformation of the Indian population after nearly 70 years of education in religious-run schools, the government felt it was time to take control. Officiating at Carlisle was Lieutenant Richard Henry Pratt, generally considered the father of Indian education. Pratt's motto, kill the Indian and save the man, reflected his reformist view that confined education at an early age could effectively extinguish tribal culture in children and replace it with Euro-American culture. Additional large off-reservation boarding schools soon sprung up all across the country, including Shalako in Oklahoma, Genoa in Nebraska, Albuquerque in New Mexico, and Haskell in Kansas. In Dakota Territory, in the years following the Battle of the Little Bighorn, the Dakota and Lakota people were treated harshly. Their children were carted off in large numbers to boarding schools in Carlisle. Many would also attend the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Hampton, Virginia. By the turn of the century, the federal government operated 113 off-and-on reservation boarding schools. 
which together with 47 mission boarding schools, enrolled over 80% of all Indian students, almost 23,000. At both government and mission schools, the goal was the same, obliterating in children all that was Indian. In the earliest days of the boarding school era, the same scene would be repeated over and over. Upon the arrival of the new Indian student, officials would ritualistically cut their hair, clothe them in stiff uniforms, and replace their Indian names with Christian names. They were not allowed to speak their tribal language, and they were forced to espouse Christianity. Other fundamental features of the boarding schools included a curriculum that stressed the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic. There was military cadet training for the boys, complete with marching and maneuvers. Administrators saw military discipline as a way to quell student unrest. The boys received industrial training, emphasizing trades such as carpentry and printing. The girls were taught domestic arts such as sewing and laundry work. Both the girls and the boys were taught farming. Students only attended school for half days, for there was arduous manual labor to be done which helped to keep the schools running. The peak years of off-reservation boarding schools were from the 1890s through the 1930s. In 1928, a report entitled The Problem of Indian Administration was published by the Brookings Institute for Government Research that shocked the nation. Known as the Miriam Report for one of its authors, the document reflected the atrocious conditions in the Indian boarding schools. The report described overcrowded and unsanitary dormitories, inadequate nutrition, child labor, and general cruelty. Boarding schools remained harsh institutions following the Miriam Report, but a few positive changes evolved, such as a reduction of student labor and a broadened curriculum. The ensuing years saw a decrease in the number of off-reservation boarding schools and increase in the number of day schools in reservation communities. But the boarding school was excruciatingly slow to disappear from the landscape. As the Great Depression of the 1930s devastated many Indian peoples, on-reservation boarding facilities grew in number. For many parents, it was the only way they could provide for their children. The 1940s also saw a resurgence in boarding schools after the House Select Committee report on Indian Affairs declared that Indians as a cultural group were still almost completely separate from the rest of America. In the Dakotas, a large number of children were placed in boarding schools in the 1950s when the Missouri River Garrison Diversion Project flooded reservation lands, displacing families and services. Interviews with those who attended Indian boarding schools uncover several pervasive themes including loneliness and isolation, running away, harsh discipline, and loss of culture. We interviewed Ed Lonefight from the Fort Bertha Reservation in western North Dakota. A Hiratsa Indian, Lonefight was sent away at an early age to the Marty Mission School in Marty, South Dakota. He went on to work in the boarding school environment eventually becoming the first Native American superintendent at the Chamawa Indian School in Salem, Oregon. We spoke with John Chasky, a member of the Spirit Lake Nation of Eastern North Dakota. He's from Crow Hill, 
an isolated community about five miles west of Fort Tott, North Dakota. He attended the Wampton boarding school for several years and the Flandreau school for one year. Chosky is now employed in education. Ambrose Little Ghost attended St. Michael's Mission School at the Fort Totten Agency and later at the Marty Mission School in Marty, South Dakota. Little Ghost is a decorated Korean War veteran. Patty Balgard is an enrolled member of the Chippewa tribe of Turtle Mountain, North Dakota. Harry Hopkins, a member of the Spirit Lake Nation, attended St. Michael's Mission School, Marty Mission School, and the Immaculate Conception Mission School in Stevan, South Dakota. Gladys Hawk is from the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. She's the great granddaughter of Chief Gull, a well-known Hunkpapcha leader. She attended St. Elizabeth Mission School at Wakpala, South Dakota, and later the Haskell Institute in Kansas. Hawk's father attended the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in its early days. No matter the memory, one thing is clear. The experience has left its indelible mark upon generations of Indian people. I can remember really vividly how uh, lonely I was, um, Our local church here, Catholic Church, my mother brought my sister and myself there and she told the priest they had called St. Michael's to come after us. Um, he put us in a different room and we're waiting in there, you know, having a snack. And uh, my mother left without telling us. That's the way they had it set up, I guess. They finally came after us, and I looked around for her. She was gone, and, and so they took us, and it was really a lonely, lonely time for me. Um, I cried a lot, you know. Um, it was really lonely, you know, the first, gee whiz, three or four months, I suppose. Then I couldn't come home Christmas, holidays, like the other kids because I didn't have nowhere to go, you know. In the summer, in the, when school, in, the, in the spring, when school went out, all the kids packing and getting ready to go home, watching the parents come after them. I had to stay because I couldn't, I didn't have nowhere to go. And then running away from school when I was in St. Michael's, they looked for us, me and two of my cousins, we ran away. It was probably in the fourth, fifth, third or fourth grade and we ran away from St. Michael and they caught us way over here in Crow Hill and they brought us back and then we got the whip, we got strapped, you know, pulled our pants down and we really, really got, really got, I mean, we got whipped, the big bar, you know, the bar things, strapped, we got whipped with that. From one of the priests, believe it or not, you know, that's what we went through in St. Michael's, you know, that's how strict they were. We ate good. We made our own bread, for one thing. After school, when they brought us back you know, in trucks, <laughs> they unloaded us, and then we would go downstairs and we would have a glass of um, powdered milk. And they would give us uh, uh, graham crackers, two pieces, and that was our snack for after school. And then we would go outside to play and whatever, and then we had nice meals. They were very good. We had a good cook. And then uh, some of us, they call us uh, cookie girls. If we were, you know, it was our duty to go down and set tables and all of that. You know, we, we had these, everybody had a chance to work. Those that were cookie girls, they did the baking of the bread and the setting of the table. I mean, you had to get up before everybody go down and help the cook. And uh, we ate uh, nutritious meals. We had our own laundry room where we did our own laundry, and they had a, a, a bell, just a huge bell that they rang in the morning for breakfast and oh well for meals. And then after uh, we ate, and then at seven o'clock or seven thirty, we had chapel. There was uh, two spaces in that building in be that set off the the 
the boys and the girls, they had two what, parlors, I guess they called them those days, parlors. One was a place where we had chapel, the other one was a place where we studied. And then uh, after chapel, then we had a study hour from eight to nine. I mean, everybody studied. And on Monday nights, this one lady that was a musician, she would have, we had a huge uh, radio that she would turn on the bell telephone hour, they called it, and it was a lot of, uh, they called it long-haired music. But we listened to that as we were studying, instilling on us, I guess, the appreciation of music. I mean, I learned to appreciate it from that point on. We had an outbreak of uh, meningitis. I got the meningitis, uh, and another gal and myself, we both had it together, but we were in separate rooms. And it, it, was, it happened when I was about maybe nine, nine years old or ten, somewhere in there. And I remember that um, the other girl passed away. She didn't make it. I remember them, I just remember bits and pieces of loading me into a car and they took me to the Fort Yates Hospital. And I was quarantined up in that hospital for a long time. I made it through that. And then there would be uh, bouts of flu every now and then, but uh, all, all they gave you it was just uh, hot soup and um, uh, whatever they could, you know. They, they, there was no antibiotics in those days. We ran away. We ran, we went to the hospital to see my mother. And then and when we got there, the doctors immediately called the school, and then they came after us. You know, you know. seen her just briefly, but she was, you know, like resting. She wasn't. Uh, she was asleep, <clears throat> and and that hurt me so bad. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't, and there wasn't anything I could do. I was just too, too small or too, to do anything. And uh, and 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 then I felt, you know. I felt like rebelling, but I knew better, and, and um, because I was punished for running away to to the, to go see my mother, and uh, and I didn't think it was right, and I didn't think it was right that I should be punished, you know. Um, and, and and they let everybody know know about it, you know, what, and uh, I didn't think that was right. So that was one of my worst days. I just uh, uh, I felt helpless, I didn't know, and I was hurt, and, and I, I cared about my mother, and I was worried about her, and, and, and there was nothing, yet there was nothing I could do about it. You know? okay. I, wrote a, I wrote about it once, uh, uh, my experience, and I compared it, I, I've never been in the, uh, in the service, and uh, from people who have been through um, boot camp and uh, in the service, you know, that have explained it to me what life was like, and 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 it's very much the same what boarding school was like for us. At Marty, we went to school a half day, academic, and the, and the, the second, the half of the other, the other half of the day was chores. We had responsibility, we had, we had responsibility to operate and manage the, the boarding school. You know, we did everything. Uh, the older kids went out and, you know, farmed. They, they, what had to be done, you know, they plowed and stuff like that. Half a day they go to school and us young guys took care of the other stuff like washing clothes and baking bakery and, and all, you know, mail and just a whole bunch of other stuff. Each person had a responsibility and uh, I got stuck with laundry. <laughs> The most difficult aspect of adjusting to a boarding school was probably the loneliness. Um, I missed my family uh, terribly uh, at the time, and, and to when I went, I, I went the full year without seeing my parents. This was going through holidays, whatever. I was steady at the boarding school, and. Uh, I think I missed home a lot, and probably that would be the biggest downfall of being into a boarding school, to lose that aspect of family life. And uh, I guess I was fortunate in being into a family that uh, my mother especially uh, thrived on, on familiness and togetherness, and, and it wasn't a big major change when I came back. 
but I did miss my family terribly. My science teacher, I felt very close to her. She was my very, very good friend. She was just young enough where we could relate to her. And she wanted always the best in all of us. And I probably will, will remember her for the rest of my life. She was a very loving person, yet I always think sometimes my personality and raising my children are kind of like her. She was probably very, very loving. I loved her a lot, but she was very strict. And at times, she'd, she'd, after you got to know her better, she'd uh, try to display this real strictness. And when you got to know what she was, you could just almost tease her out of it. And she'd laugh at us because we pretty well had her figured out too. She was tough because uh, she thought she had to be. There was a saying a long time ago that, you know, that the white society are trying to make us what they are, but they cannot change our color. That whatever they t tell us or whatever they have for us, in store for us at that time, we accepted to learn. Because at one time long ago, Sittenbull had said, learn what you can from the white people that is good and leave the bad. And, leave it, and learning something good is learning the education. Well, in the beginning, you know, that I thought that, you know, that they're trying to make me to learn something I didn't learn and also to, to push religion off me, which I didn't have no understanding. A person who, you know, grew up in a family that had the understanding of the language and also with the religion, it's easy for them to, to adjust. When you get into a situation where you don't know what is going around on the outside, and then when you get out there, it's altogether different. It's all foreign to you. Like I've always said, you know, I live in two different worlds. I live in my world. I speak in my world. I live in the other world, which I speak the English language. And I can, you know, communicate in both. As these spoken histories or bittersweet memories show, the boarding school experience conjures up both the positive and negative. In either case, the lives of the students who attended and in turn the lives of the tribal members of the communities to which they returned change in both expected and unexpected ways. When federal policy was focused on total assimilation of the Native American, its shortcomings were apparent. Upon returning to their reservations, a significant number of students again took up their tribal dress, language, and former religious practices. They adopted what they learned in boarding schools to their own culture and were never fully transformed. Such students were said to have returned to the blanket and it represented just one facet of what the government called the return student problem. To the disappointment of the proponents of assimilation, most students continue to identify with the tribal culture while acquiring the knowledge to function in a white man's world. Some students absorbed aspects of other students' tribal culture and language as well. This exposure, together with the potency of a shared experience, promoted the emergence of a new collective Indian identity by bringing together the people of various tribes Boarding schools gave them a broader sense of being Indian and a growing realization that they shared a common identity and common problem. The outgrowth of this pan-Indianism, as it was called, was political activism. Former students used a newly acquired education and social skills to become advocates for Indian rights. As early as 1911, a group was formed to advance the political rights of American Indians throughout the nation. The Society of American Indians favored citizenship for Indians, opposed the Indian Bureau for its paternalistic policies, and promoted individual and tribal autonomy. 
The National Congress of American Indians was formed in 1941. The Native American movement in the United States fostered the involvement of Indians themselves in designing their educational opportunities. A Kennedy Area Congressional Report entitled Indian Education, A National Tragedy, A National Challenge, triggered many reforms during the 1960s and 1970s. Tribes sought and won grants to establish their own private, nonprofit schools, apart from the federal government. Many of these schools, such as Rough Rock, established in 1966 on Arizona's Navajo Reservation, broke new ground by stressing the study of tribal culture and language. In 1975, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act allowed tribes to assume management of Bureau of Indian Affairs or government-run schools. This was a milestone, marking the decline of federal involvement in Indian education. This new era in Indian education saw the closing of many boarding schools. The trend towards tribal self-determination and local control continues today. Indian boarding schools still exist, but in far fewer numbers. These are managed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, others are tribally sponsored, and a few are run by religious groups. The Tribal Control Community College Assistance Act was passed in 1978 authorizing Congress to fund community colleges on Indian reservations. Indian educators in North Dakota who envisioned college as a way to reclaim the past and secure the future for Indian nations were quick to react. Turtle Mountain Community College was among the first tribally controlled community colleges in the nation. In the following years, Sitting Bull Community College, Fort Berthold Community College, Chandeska Jikala College, and the United Tribe Technical College were all established in North Dakota. A look back at the Indian boarding school experience can provide meaningful insight into an entire culture. Generations of Indian children were placed in boarding schools and the cross-generational effects extend into the present and will extend into the future. So in our healing process, I think one of the things that I'm really um, aware of as an, a native social worker, as a person that's had an opportunity to travel across Indian country, Canada, U.S., and spend many hours with elders, with spiritual people, with community people, with people my age, people younger, we all have that hurt that has come as a result of boarding schools, whether it was something that was fairly minor that happened to something that was very major that happened within family systems. It's there. And we're finally taking off the layers of that wound that's been festering there for years. And as we all know in our recovery process, the first thing is, is to be able to talk about it, to put a name to it, and for that group to come together and say, no, this wasn't right. But the most important thing is, is to look at it, to understand it, to acknowledge it, and then whatever pieces we can forgive, to forgive, and then to move on. And so when that connection there that's been broken with, with like my grandparents' generation and my parents' generation, where that connection to the old ones, to the ancestors, has, has been broken or fragmented, that it's, it's very thin, then now it's our responsibility in this generation to revisit that pain, to do ceremony, to do whatever we can do to heal that, and even to try to heal it for our mothers and our grandparents, if there's some way we can do that through ceremony. Because we do carry that from generation to generation. So it's our responsibility to do that healing. And it's tough to do because we're out there and we don't have that support system that our relatives had, our old, the ancient ones. We don't have the language sometimes. We don't have those old, old ceremonies or those things that come with the seasons, the cycle of the seasons, the songs, just everything that was just included in day-to-day -day life. And so sometimes we have to reach back as far as we can to bring them forward. And sometimes we just have to go with what we have, what we can remember, and maybe even kind of make do with what we can take forward. 
And so I see a lot of people in Indian country at that point in time, that healing point, looking. And so it's time to get over the anger. I, you know, felt bad because I didn't learn my language. The ceremonies were long gone in my tribe. They're coming back. They're not as strong as they once were. But we have that connection. And I think one of the nicest things about being a native person is, is that we have our ancestors with us every day. Every day they're here with us. They walk with us. They talk to us. They nurture us. We just need to make that connection stronger with them because they've never really left us through what we've been through. It's amazing. They've never really left us. Mmm. -hmm. 